Ah, now it says live. Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone. Today we have the author of this terrific book, Defending the Undefendable, by the great Austrian economist, Walter Block. How are you? Pretty good. Thanks for having me on your show. Absolutely. W what I love about the book is in the introduction, you define your terms. Uh, so many people can write books and articles without defining their terms. Uh, what is libertarianism and how has how have people made a caricature of it and what is that caricature well in my view well you know if you have 10 libertarians in a room and you ask that question you'll get 11 different answers <laughs> but my uh my view is that libertarianism asks only one question and gives only one answer and the one question it asks is under what conditions is uh, violence justified or the threat of violence? And it gives only one answer in response to a prior threat of violence or actual uh, violence. So it's okay if you and I are in the boxing match and you hit me in the nose. Uh, I can't sue you for assault and battery because I agreed to be there. And as long as you hit me above the belt, uh, everything is kosher. Uh, on the other hand, if, if uh, we haven't agreed and all of a sudden you punch me in the nose, I can use violence against you. And this sort of opens up another question. Well, who owns my nose? You know, why, why do I get to own my nose? And there you need a uh, sort of a homesteading theory of noses and, and bodies and, and property. And uh, we go along with the Rothbardian, Lockean view of um, homesteading. I homesteaded myself. I homestead some land. And uh, now I can trade, uh, you know, if I grow corn and you domesticate a cow, I um, I can uh, I own the the corn. You own the milk, and now we can trade. And now I own the milk, even though I didn't produce it. You own the corn, even though you didn't produce that. And that's pretty much libertarianism. The rest is just uh, implications of that. One important implication would be uh, free association. That the only time people should associate with each other is if both parties or all parties agree, and no one should be forced to associate with anyone against his will. Uh, because that would be slavery or rape or something like that. And I think in a nutshell, that's what libertarianism is. So, so this book was originally written in 1976. And I can't hear you anymore. I, I can't hear you. I don't know what's going on. I heard up to Anne. This book was written in 1976, and All right. So uh, now, now I can hear you again. Perfect. This book was written in 1976, and on page 18, you refute the gender pay gap myth that today everyone in Hollywood believes from Meryl Streep down to the, your everyday feminist. How has such a myth been able to last so long? Well, uh, I don't really want to take credit for refuting it. Uh, I, it wasn't original with me. <clears throat> Most economists would agree with me. Uh, Walter Williams and Thomas Sowell have done yeoman work in, in uh, uh, up undying that myth, and many other economists have as well. Uh, the, the, the situation is that the reason uh, – your question is how, how come it lasts so long? I should answer the question you ask me. Uh, I guess because of economic illiteracy, that would be my two-word answer. And maybe the feminists uh, have uh, an ox to gore or you know something to gain by keeping this myth going. Uh, the fact of the matter is that in the ninth wages, the economist in me says, well, what determines wages? And the answer is productivity. Uh, Bill Gates has got a lot of productivity, and he makes a lot of money, and a uh, uh, I have a medium productivity. I make a middle class income and the guy who pushes a broom has a lower class uh, income and a lower class productivity. Productivity is defined as how much will you add to the bottom line of your employer? And uh, LeBron James will add a lot to his employer because he can fill seats uh, to people who watch him play basketball. And I can do a little bit of it. And the guy with the broom helps a little also. So, Productivity determines wages. Now, in the 19th century and the 18th century, men were more productive than women on average because men are stronger than women. And the way we uh, had most jobs, uh, you needed upper body strength. 
the way we would cut down a tree is with sawing the tree. Uh, the way we would uh, dig a hole to put a foundation for a building would be to uh, dig it with picks and shovels. And men are stronger than women. But nowadays, uh, the puzzle is uh, men are not most jobs don't require that. Very, very few jobs really require uh, physical strength. Uh, women can cut down a tree as well as men because it's done mechanically, and they can dig a hole or build a building uh, just as well as men because it's uh, uh, done mechanically. So why then is there still this gap? And the reason that there's still this gap is a, a thing called opportunity cost. Namely, whenever you do anything, you do it at the cost of not being able to do something else at all or as well. And the example I like to use is Usain Bolt is probably a lousy cellist because he hardly ever plays the cello. And uh, Yo-Yo Ma, the greatest cellist, uh, is probably uh, got a lousy time in the 100 or the 200 because he doesn't work uh, uh, in the gym as much. Uh, so each uh, now if Yo-Yo Ma would, would get out on the track and stop playing cello, his times would improve. And if Usain Bolt would leave off his running and pick up the cello uh, six hours a day, he'd be better at that. So that's the doctrine of alternative costs. Whenever you do anything, you do it at the cost of not being able to do something else at all or as well. So why then are women less productive? Because uh, the main reason, I think, is because of marital asymmetry. It's called the marital asymmetry hypothesis. Namely, women have the lion's share of housekeeping and uh, baby care and shopping and cooking and cleaning and stuff like that. Uh, studies show that they do, oh, 80 or 90 percent of the housekeeping uh, and cooking. So uh, that means they got to do something else less well because they're doing that. Well, one of the things they do less well is jobs, productivity. And there are two proofs of this or two bits of evidence for it. One, the average uh, pay gap is something like 20 to 25 percent. But if you look at people who have never been married, not widowed, not divorced, not separated, not nothing, there's no gap. On the other hand, if you look at people who have ever been married, namely they're married, they're widowed, they're divorced, they're separated, the gap is way bigger than 25%, something like 40 or 50%, depending upon what year and what education and, and which country. I've done research in Canada and the U.S. So, you know, if, if it was really discrimination, why? That's the other hypothesis. Men discriminate against women. I tell you, most of the heterosexual men I know don't discriminate against women. Very much the opposite. But if it were really true, why would there be such a difference between ever married and never married? Why is it that the 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 never married have no gap? Or if you just take the wages of uh, males and females age oh, 16 to 24, which is a proxy variable for never married because most people aren't married then, again, there's no gap or there's very, very small gap. And then the other thing, uh, sort of a logical proof, if there really were a gap and men and women were equal productive, but... Uh, uh, let's say a man and a woman each made, um, uh, I don't know, each had a productivity of $10 an hour, and one of them was paid $10 an hour, so you, the man, and you make nothing off of him, and the woman was paid $7 an hour, I'd offer the woman 701 You would offer the woman 702 Somebody else would offer the woman 703 Where would it end? At 10 So th the whole thing is nonsense on a stick, or uh, I forget what the aphorism no. is. Uh, uh, on stilts, nonsense, not not on a stick, but on stilts. The whole thing is nonsense. And yet the, the feminists make great play about this. You know, men are unfair to women and you get this um, intersectionality and, you know, the men have privilege and women don't have privilege and, you know, white people have privilege and black people don't and straights do and gays don't. The whole thing is just nonsense on stilts. <laughs> Thanks for your correction. Uh, but, you know, our friends on the left have to talk about something, so man, they pick this nonsense. It's so funny because, like, if libertarians had complaints about governments that feminists have against men, we'd sound so pathetic. Like, if we were like, governments mansplain and it takes them too long to explain things and government employees sit with their legs out like this and that's government sitting spreading <laughs> <laughs> like we would sound like a movement that should die right away but so uh, the fact that there is a, a movement like this it, it is is just unbelievable and in 1776 you talk about it um, of seven, 1976. I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I get great years mixed up.
Thomas Sowell was talking to Dennis Prager about this and he just said, well, if that were true, businesses would just hire women and put their competitors out of business. Tom Woods says this, these stats don't account for number of hours worked and different jobs that they have. It's, it's, it's just so obvious. In your excellent uh, chapter titled The Advertiser, you talk about regulation. What is the libertarian uh, anarcho-capitalist position on regulation? Well, we've got to have some regulations. We should have laws against murder, laws against slavery, laws against kidnapping, laws against, I don't know, arson, laws against uh, extortion, laws against uh, all those initiations of violence. And that's it. No other regulations. Uh, you know, uh, you should be free to sell milk, uh, whether it's pasteurized or not. Now, you shouldn't commit fraud. We should have uh, rules against fraud because that would be akin to theft. But uh, so we libertarians are moderate. We're not against all regulations. We're not against all laws. We have to have laws. We have to have regulations uh, just compatible with the non-aggression principle, namely keep your goddamn mitts to yourself and don't grab other people or their property without their permission. And so we're moderates. We we believe in laws, but not that many. Whereas you know most people believe in a lot more laws than that. And I think what is it? Seventy thousand pages of laws are created every year by uh, our friends in Washington. You know, some crazy thing like uh, I don't know how how big a ladder can be and and how big the bathtub can be and and how many gallons should be in your um, uh, your toilet bowl and you know all sorts of regulations. But we libertarians wouldn't agree with that. It's so funny. You, you say that the regulations we need, no theft, no murder, no fraud. When people are like, if we want to start a new civilization, what should the rules be? No theft, no murder, no fraud. The three things government does all the time, theft by its very nature, murder, because it has a monopoly on that violence and all wars and genocides are from governments and fraud. Uh, come on, a lying politician. That's so that, that's just ridiculously obvious. The, the joke is, how do you tell a politician is lying? He moves his lips or he writes or something like that. You're so young and so cynical, I'm shocked. <laughs> well, it, it's difficult not to be. Um, in the gypsy cab driver, you talk about uh, destroy the system of restrictive cab licenses. And today we have Uber. So instead of fighting to end the licenses, the market just out innovated the state. Is that a way to defeat statism, focus on out innovating it, providing a better product, or uh, or should we focus on the non-aggression principle or both? Well, I think the way to get rid of the state is to change the hearts and minds of the people. Uh, just innovating, uh, all they'll do is put you in jail for innovating if we don't change the hearts and minds of the people. So uh, not that I think we can change the hearts and minds of the people. I mean, some very, very bright people have been trying for many years, Ludwig von Mises, um, Murray Rothbard, Ayn Rand, Ron Paul, people like that, and they haven't succeeded. And I think there's a reason for that. I think that we're biologically uh, predisposed towards statism. So uh, I don't think we're going to succeed, but I think it's fun trying, and I think we all should keep trying as best we can, like you and I are now doing. But I don't deceive myself into thinking that we're going to succeed, uh, certainly not anytime soon. Uh, and, and certainly innovation won't do it. Although there's a whole literature on, you know, whenever an innovation comes, does this help or hurt statism? For example, when the, the crossbow came in, did that help or hurt statism? Uh, when the, the rifle came in or when the musket came in or when uh, the computers came in? Uh, and um, I, I, if I had to summarize that literature, I would say it's a tie. Some innovations help statism, some uh, innovations hurt statism. So if you look at all innovations, I think <laughs> we're about where we would otherwise be without any innovations. I, I, so I don't think it has much to do with statism, uh, although any one innovation might help or hurt statism. You know, when I read books, here are just the two books I was working with earlier today, Anatomy of the State by Murray Rothbard and The Problem of Political Authority by Michael Humer just makes such a logical defeat of the uh, logic of statism that I, I, I'm much more uh, optimistic about uh, the future. In, in your chapter, The Inheritor, uh, you talk about Harrison Berger, Bergeron and equality. What are some Harrison Bergeron lessons we can learn? 
Well, this was a, a, a short story by Kurt Vonnegut, who was no libertarian, but on this issue, he was very libertarian. And what he was doing is uh, spoofing egalitarianism. He was saying the ultimate end of egalitarianism is uh, making everyone equal. So like if you're big and strong, you have to walk around with a hundred pound sack on your back. If you're brilliant, you have to wear earphones like you're wearing, only they have to pound at you like this so that you can't think. And if you're, um, uh, I don't know, a piano player, we have to, um, uh, I don't know, cut off half your fingers or, or something like that. And it, it just sort of takes egalitarianism to its logical uh, extent. Um, my argument against egalitarianism, uh, if I see an egalitarian with two eyes, I say, I notice you have two eyes. There are blind people out there. And, you know, if you give them one eye, it's true you'll lose your depth perception and you won't make it in the major league baseball because you need depth perception for that. But uh, if you're blind and you go from blindness to one eye, it's a gigantic opening. You gain a lot. Whereas if you lose one eye, you lose just a little bit. So why don't you be a good guy and give him one of your eyes? And I notice you have two of them. So you're a hypocrite. You're not even following your principles. Whereas we libertarians can follow our principles because all our principles say is keep your mitts off of other people. And as long as we don't engage in all these uh, nefarious things, we're compatible with our philosophy, but they can't be compatible with their philosophy just on the issue of eyes alone. And how about IQ? I mean, uh, you and I are pretty bright people and uh, our friends on the left are also very bright people. The intelligentsia, the, the sociology professor with the PhD, uh, uh, they're, they're not stupid. Um, Suppose we had a machine, a sort of a Robert Nozickian machine that could transfer IQ points from smart people to stupid people. Would they voluntarily get in there and lose 20 IQ points and give it to somebody who's really uh, 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 has very few IQ points? I doubt it. Would they put their kids in there? God forbid. Um, I doubt it. So, you see, all they talk about is taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor. But how about taking stuff that gets you the money in the first place, like intelligence or beauty or Yo-Yo uh, uh, Ma's ability or Usain Bolt's ability and giving that ability to other people. The, the egalitarians don't go for that at all. And yet they should. Well, They're really good egalitarians. Yeah. Uh, hearing Paul Krugman write about inequality, meanwhile, his articles get so many more views than yours or Tom Woods's or Robert Murphy's, or Bernie Sanders has the right with his friends to pass a law that we have to abide by. Him and his 535 friends have control over 330 million Americans, and he believes in equality. Really? It, it, it's, it's so inconsistent. By uh, the way, I, I went to high school with Bernie. Uh, he and I were uh, at Madison High School for four years and Brooklyn College for one year. We were on the track team together. We uh, ran the same events, half mile and up. And uh, he's, a, he's a bloody commie. He's a, he's a nice guy. I remember him from high school and college. He's a nice guy, but he's a bloody commie. And th that's despicable. Was he a member of Students for a Democratic Society or Weather Underground back then? I don't think they had that in my day. Remember, this was 1776. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, all right. Chapter 17, The Money Lender. Many people who get into uh, politics will say the problem is usury, interest on money. How can you defend the money lender? Well, it's a voluntary act between consenting adults. You know, I lend you uh, 10 bucks and I say that in a year you have to pay me uh, 12 bucks. That's a 20% interest rate. And, you know, people would say, well, that's unconscionable. That's usurious or whatever. And we should limit the, the interest rate that people can charge each other. But, you know, whenever you uh, lower prices and, and the interest rate is sort of a price in this context, uh, uh, demand is greater than supply and people want to borrow money and nobody wants to lend money. If we said that you can only charge 1% interest, uh, the uh, supply of funds would dry up and the demand for loanable funds would increase and you'd have a, a shortage. And then they blame that on capitalism when it's really the fault of, uh, of uh, the interest rate, uh, you know, keeping interest rates below um, 
uh, equilibrium levels. Uh, they're against payday lending. They're against the lending of this sort. And then what they do is if the banks or legitimate uh, lend, well, banks aren't that all, all that legitimate, but if legitimate lenders can't charge the interest rate that they want, they won't uh, lend at all. And then the people that want to borrow will have to go to underground people or uh, people who, uh, when they have a dispute with you, they they uh, take a baseball bat and knock your knee off or something like that. So this doesn't really help the people, the very people that they're trying to help. And it's a similar uh, thing with rent control. They try to keep rents down, and then you have a shortage of housing. So uh, whenever you interfere with the, the market, uh, supply and demand of the market, whether it's a, a price maximum or a price minimum, you're going to create a shortage or a surplus, and that's going to be a problem. In your chapter, the no the non-contributor to charity, you talk about G. William Domoff's book, The Higher Circles, and the Cloward and Piven strategy. Uh, what is uh, significant about those two? Well, um, Piven and Cloward were saying that uh, charity is really, um, that they're, they're big leftists. Um, uh, I think they were both professors of social work at uh, Columbia University. And what they were uh, saying is that uh, charity is uh, a way of keeping the poor down. And, you know, I, I don't buy that. Uh, Domhoff, I'm surprised I mentioned Domhoff in that chapter. Domhoff is more of a revisionist historian who's done great work on U.S. imperialism. So I'm, I'm surprised I put him in there. I'd have to look at that to refresh my memory about it. But uh, the idea here is that, you know, we libertarians are always saying that uh, – we don't want government welfare. Government welfare is bad. It breaks up the black family. It, it ruins incentives. And, and I certainly agree with that. And then we, what we libertarians say when we're asked, well, what about the poor? We say, well, charity, private charity. And what I'm trying to do is say, well, suppose I don't commit uh, suppose I don't give to charity. Should I be put in jail? Should I? Uh, am I uh, guilty of violating rights by not giving to charity? And I say no. And you know, the, the issue uh, comes up, who made a greater contribution to the poor, Bill Gates or Mother Teresa? Now, Mother Teresa gave charity to the poor. Bill Gates nowadays gives charity, but forget about his charitable givings now. What about when he made his fortune, uh, billions of dollars in Microsoft? And I think a, a clear case can be made that he did more to end poverty by earning money than he is doing now by giving the charity. I mean, most of his charitable work now is sort of supporting left-wing causes. So uh, he might even be undermining what he initially did. So uh, I, I, you see, the, the whole idea of defending the undefendable is I'm taking people or professions or activities that don't violate rights and yet are hated or illegal, and I'm defending them. Well, the guy who doesn't give to charity should also be defended. Yes, the people who give to charity, they're okay. There's nothing wrong with the charity. And if you give to charity to the poor, we libertarians will not put you in jail for that. But uh, people who don't give to charity are also uh, uh, legitimate people. And I tell you that the best way to help the poor, if you're so concerned with the poor, is to make a lot of money honestly, because every time you make a, a dollar, you're benefiting someone else. I mean, Bill Gates sold a uh, computer for a thousand bucks. How much did the people value that computer who bought it for a thousand bucks? Well, at least a thousand and one bucks, and usually a lot more than that. So he benefited them every time he made money. So trade is mutually beneficial, and that would be the point I'm trying to make in that chapter. Ludwig von Mises has a great uh, book collection of essays titled The Anti-Capitalist Mentality. How do you approach, how do you understand the anti-capitalist mentality? Well, you know, as I was saying before, I'm a, um, when I was giving my pessimistic outlook for whether, you know, why is it that Ron Paul isn't president? Why is it that uh, 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 the New York Times uh, guy, what was the, the guy's name you mentioned, Krugman, uh, gets an audience of, I don't know, millions, and, and you and I get an audience of hundreds or maybe thousands if we're lucky? And I think it's due to sociobiological uh, uh, considerations. Uh, so what is sociobiology? Sociobiology is the theory that we now behave in a way uh, that is a vestige from what 
what meant for survival, what led to survival a million years ago when we were in the caves or in the trees. Let me give you an example or two and then apply it to why libertarianism isn't more popular than it really should be. Take the case of snakes and bathtubs. How many people are afraid of bathtubs? Nobody's afraid of a bathtub. It's ridiculous. How many people are afraid of snakes? If you see a snake crawling on the ground, I mean, most people go like this, you know, my God, there's a snake. And yet bathtubs kill many, many more people than snakes do. Milton Friedman was killed by a bathtub. He was 90 or 95 years old. He slipped in the bathtub. He hit his head on, on the side of the bathtub. And on the way to the hospital, he died. A lot of people die from bathtubs. And virtually no one dies from snakes in the United States. And yet we're very afraid of snakes. And nobody's afraid of a bathtub. Why? Well, because a million years ago, if you were afraid of a bathtub, did that help you leave more progeny to the next generation? No. The, the whole idea is ludicrous. But if you weren't afraid of a snake, if you'd go up to the snake and pat the snake and ask him if he's a friendly snake or not, you wouldn't leave as many children uh, as other people would. So we are biologically... Uh, oriented to be afraid of snakes, even though they're no longer a danger. And we're not biologically afraid to be afraid of bathtubs because there were no bathtubs a million years ago. And, and being afraid of a bathtub conferred nothing on you in terms of being able to leave more genetic material to the next generation. People well, like, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I was going to change uh, the, the subject uh, to oh, the next well, question. Did you have well, more? Let me, let me just continue. So what I'm trying to say is that, uh, there are two ways that we can help each other. One is uh, through benevolence and the other way is through markets. And we are very hardwired toward benevolence because in our tribe, you got sick this week, I helped you. Next week, I get sick, you help me. Our tribe survives. Our, uh, our tribe prospers. And in this other tribe that has the same... I don't know, uh, strength and the same opposable thumb and the same intelligence, but they don't help each other. You get sick this week, I don't help you. Next week, I get sick, you don't help me. Our tribe disappears. So we're hardwired for benevolence, but we're not hardwired for markets because a million years ago, we didn't have too much free enterprise. There weren't, there wasn't much trade. So I get students, freshman students, and, you know, they talk about price gouging and, you know, price gouging, as we know, is a good thing because markets, market prices are uh, a good thing. But the, they, they think that, you know, we should only have benevolence. So I think that libertarians are pushing free enterprise and pr pushing markets, and we're pushing uphill because people are uh, biologically uh, uh, biased against markets and our middle name is markets or free enterprise and that's why i think we're doing very poorly and that's my sociological sociobiological explanation your turn next question robert higgs has given a lot of analysis on history through the libertarian lens in his great book crisis and leviathan philosophically when it comes to atrocities committed by the u.s military who do you believe holds more moral culpability, the soldier who follows the orders or the Henry Kissingers and Donald Trumps of the world who are the order givers? Well, that's a good question. I mean, like take Hitler, our man Hitler. Uh, let's say he never killed anyone uh, explicitly. He never pulled the trigger. He never uh, hung anyone. He never gassed anyone. He never, all he did is give orders. Well, is he innocent? <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's a little silly. Uh, no, he's not innocent, even though he didn't uh, physically kill anyone. Uh, he is responsible for killing, I don't know, 11 million people. So I would say, yes, the general is, is more guilty than the colonel, and the colonel is more guilty than the major, and the major is more guilty than the captain, all the way down through lieutenant, corporal, and, and individual soldier, even though the individual soldier and maybe the corporal and sergeant are the ones who do the actual killing. Uh, the guys who gave him the orders are, I think, even more guilty than uh, the people who actually did did the uh, the dirty deed. Uh, take the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, uh, the the people who did that, who actually dropped the bombs on on the Japanese, they weren't the they weren't giving the orders. The orders were given by the generals or by the president. Well, the, actually, the president. Uh, in that case. So I would agree with you that the higher up the hierarchy you go, the more guilt, even though the less explicit um, involvement with the crime.
The mafia boss is a bad guy. Even though he only gives orders, he doesn't kill anyone. Do you have any advice for debating statists? I've seen your uh, Jan Helfeld debate. A any advice for uh, tapping into the statist mind? Well, that's a good one. I'm, I'm, I'm having part two with Jan Helfeld. He's a very, very good debater, and I wish I had done better. I, I've never given a perfect speech. I've never given a perfect interview, and I've never done a perfect debate. I, I only do my best. Uh, I don't know. I guess smile <laughs> and um, try to take the other guy, listen to the other guy and take notes while he's speaking so that you can refute him because he's a status. So he's the bad guy. Be open to the possibility that he can convince you because we're out after the truth. Although I've been doing this many years and I'm still a non-status. Um, I guess uh, be prepared, uh, have a, have your arguments on a, on a piece of paper so that if you forget what you're doing, you can refer to your notes. Uh, and I guess my best advice is have fun. Try to enjoy, try to enjoy it. Uh, it'll, you'll do better if, if you were actually enjoying the debate than if you look upon it as, you know, uh, a chore or a, something negative. It's so interesting. While debating the legitimacy of the state or the legitimacy of coercive payments through taxation or the mass murder committed by states or the victimless crimes they put people in cages for, people will say, you know what, we need a state because who will build the roads? You have answered this question in your excellent book, The Privatization of Roads and Highways. What can you tell the person who says, but who will build the roads? Well, the main reason I, I wrote that book is because you know how many people die on the roads? Something like 33,000 a year. It, it varies uh, it, anywhere from 30 to 40,000 a year over the last 10, 20, 30 years. You know, we talk about how many people died in 9-11. We talk about how many people died in um, uh, Katrina. Now, in this horrible case of Florida, 17 kids were killed. Well, you know, I don't want to deprecate the killings in, in Florida or New York or New Orleans, but you get 17 or 3,000 or 1,900. On the roads, 33,000 people die every year. I mean, that's really gargantuan. Uh, and it's government roads. And, you know, the, the reason is, I think, because we don't have competition. Look, the reason we have pretty good shirts and pretty good, um, I see a fan uh, above you, or uh, pretty good wristwatches, uh, is because we have competition. And if you don't make a good wristwatch or a fan or a shirt, you go broke and you have to do something else. And the people who remain are pretty good. Not excellent because the human condition, we're not excellent, but we do our best. But this competition, well, you know, if I own one road and you own another road and I did something that saved lives, I'd start bragging, hey, everyone come to my road uh, because I'm saving lives. And uh, maybe you would copy me. Whereas right now we have the rules of the road and everything about the road is, comes from Washington, D.C. And um, there's no competition. Like, uh, let me just give you one example of that. Right now, uh, I'm in New Orleans. I'm near the I-10 highway. And on the I-10 highway, like all the other in, uh, interstate highways, uh, the minimum speed is 40 and the maximum speed is 70. And most people do 72, 75. If you do 65, you know, most cars are going to be passing you, even if you're doing 70. Was that the best way to go? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it would be better if uh, the, mid the right lane, everyone had to do 55, and the middle lane, everyone had to do 65, and the left lane, everyone had to do 75. Or maybe it should be uh, 70, uh, 60, 70, and 80. I don't know. All I'm saying is that if your road did one thing and my road did another thing and this other guy's road did another thing and we kept tabs of who's dying, uh, on these roads, maybe we'd get better rules of the road. And maybe, you know, one of the things that ticks me off on roads is somebody in the left lane who's doing exactly 70 or maybe 68 and everyone wants to do 75 and they're going around and maybe it's lane changes that cause accidents. And maybe, uh, we should really, uh, stop that again. I don't know. I'm not a road uh, entrepreneur. All I am is an economist. And, and my, e my economics tells me competition will bring, a, bring about a better product at a lower price. And what I'm doing there is trying to apply this to esoteric areas where it's never been applied before much. 
and roads would be one of the things. Well, how would the how would we build roads? The same way we build, um, I don't know, uh, hospitals or uh, or uh, universities or high rise buildings or whatever. Somebody wants to build a road. Where are you now, Keith? Arizona. Arizona, uh, Phoenix, Tucson. Chandler. I'm sorry. Chandler, Arizona. Okay, well, I want to build a road. I don't want to build a road to Chandler. There's nobody there except you. I'll build a road to Phoenix. I want to build a road from New Orleans to Phoenix. Well, I start buying up property and buying cement, and I build a road. That's how you do it. And then instead of charging uh, taxes, uh, I charge a, a fee uh, to be on the road. And the fee would be much less than the taxes that are paid. So private enterprise can build roads, and if we build roads, they would be safer. It's amazing to think that people can look at the road and see all the cars the free markets produced, but see just a flat thing of tar and say, without government, none of this would be possible. It, it, like without Nancy Pelosi, this none of this would exist. Uh, look, the, the first pr in my book, I go over the first roads. The first roads were private turnpike roads. Uh, they were uh, dirt roads because we didn't have tar or, or cement or anything like that. People would charge, you know, to go from point A to B. They, in the early days, they would even charge, you know, more for a wagon than a horse and more for a wagon with thin wheels, think of ice skates, than thick wheels because thin wheels would put ruts in the road and thick wheels would iron out the road. So you had private enterprise building dirt roads. So we've done it before. It's just that the government, in effect, prohibited private roads and then took it over. A very similar thing with railroads. Um, in New York City, there are three roads, the IRT, the BMT, and the IND. Well, the IRT and the BMT, uh, interborough rapid transit and borough Manhattan traffic, I forget the, the exact what they, they are. These were private uh, private roads, and they were charging a nickel uh, to get on them, and they were contemplating raising it to a dime. And uh, the mayor said, oh, my, you can't raise it to a dime. That's crazy. We're going to nationalize, or in this case, municipalize. Now, people say, well, you can't have railroads uh, without the government. It's nonsense. We had private railroads. We had private roads. The government prohibited them. And then you have all sorts of breakdowns. The Amtrak is always breaking over and breaking up, and they go 40 miles an hour anyway. So um, uh, we should privatize. My motto is if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. And since everything either moves or doesn't move, privatize everything. In the myth of the robber bar barons, Bert Folsom talks about uh, how James J. Hill and Cornelius Vanderbilt totally out innovated the state in every way and privatized steam engines and railroads, did it voluntarily. Hans Hermann Hoppe has a great point about monopolies that in every sector, uh, economists will say monopolies are bad, but when it comes to the state, they're like, we need a monopoly. How has that total contradiction been able to exist in the minds of, of philosophers and economists? Well, my answer is sociobiology. We're hardwired oh, okay. to, to it being uh, commies, and there are a lot of commies out there, but Hans is brilliant. I mean, uh, that's a brilliant point that, uh, w you know, all of a sudden we're, we're pro-monopoly when we have antitrust. Look, if you have to have antitrust, let's let them break up monopoly, let them break up the government monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> what are the most important books on anarcho-capitalism? Oh, that's a rough question. Pretty much anything written by Murray Rothbard <laughs> will do. Uh, Hans Hoppe, we just mentioned him. He's a brilliant uh, anarchist. Uh, other, uh, Stefan Kinsella is a brilliant anarcho theorist. Um, Lysander Spooner, uh, to go back a little bit, Molinari. Uh, uh, I have a list, I have a bibliography of anarchist writings. Uh, Bob Murphy wrote a brilliant thing. Would the, who is it going to take over? The warlords. Will the warlords take over? Uh, there, I've written a little bit on that as well. Uh, there are many, many libertarian anarcho-capitalist people. Most of them focused around the Mises Institute, of which I'm uh, a senior fellow and I'm, I'm a very big fan of theirs. Uh, uh, so these are some of the anarchist uh, people that have written. Now, these are libertarian anarchists. There are commie anarchists. You know, uh, there's a uh, Kropotkin and Bakunin and a bunch of Russians and and there's even what's that guy the linguist he's from the Massachusetts um, Chomsky 
Chomsky. Chomsky is also a sort of a left wing. Uh, now Chomsky is very good on um, on foreign policy. He's uh, a peacenik, which is good. But when it comes to uh, economics, uh, all these people are weird. They're, they're against money, which is you know, a voluntary way of facilitating trade. They're against profit. They're against interest rates. They don't understand economics. Uh, so we, right wing, although I don't like right wing, um, we libertarian anarchists are, I think, correct. And the left wing anarchists are, are not. Uh, they're just uh, weak on economics. Are you uh, familiar with the work of Ralph Rako? Oh, yes. Ralph is a buddy of mine. Sure. I'm a big fan of his. Uh, what are some of the great uh, important insights from Ralph Rako? Just his book, Great Wars and Great Leaders, A Libertarian Rebuttal, I think is so valuable. What are some of the things uh, you learned from Ralph Rako? Well, he's a revisionist historian in the vein of Murray Rothbard, who was his teacher and my teacher as well. And uh, Ralph has done yeoman work in, in showing that uh, these wars were mainly started by the U.S. Uh, uh, and that, you know, Murray and Ralph uh, have this thing uh, against a priori history. See, a lot of historians, what they'll say about the Soviets is, look, Soviet economics is very bad. Soviet domestic policy is very bad uh, under Stalin and under uh, Lenin. Uh, they, they're just murderous thugs. And therefore, they want to take over the world. And then they start talking about, well, Eastern Europe and, and stuff like that. And what Murray says is, look, Germany invaded um, Russia twice in the last century. The U.S. was involved in 1917 in their uh, revolution. Mainly what the Russians were trying to do is have a cordon sanitaire between them and, and, and Germany. <laughs> Namely, they wanted to take over all these countries in between Germany and Russia so that Germany would have a hard time getting to Russia. And, you know, how many military bases did Russia have in 1963? Well, they had one in Cuba. And everyone went berserk. You know, uh, Ralph Rako would show that this sort of a thing that, uh, you know, they had one military base, whereas the U.S. had military bases all around Russia and Turkey and, you know, Japan and here and there and everywhere. And uh, Ralph and, and Murray have been, uh, and also Leonard Leggio, another follower of Murray and friend for many years, although they had a parting, um, demonstrate that, you know, just because a country domestically is evil doesn't mean that they're evil foreign policy. And just because they're pretty good, relatively speaking, domestically like the U.S. is, doesn't mean that the U.S. is not an imperialist nation. So this is some of the lessons I learned from Ralph and, and Leonard and, and Murray. A uh, famous Keynesian economist, Paul Samuelson, said that the Soviet Union will surpass, will most likely surpass the United States economy by 1990 definitely by 2015. Why are Keynesians not just a little off? They're so wrong. Why is that? Well, uh, Samuelson said that. And, you know, whenever uh, he even drew a graph showing you know, that the United States is uh, slightly inclined and the Russians are inclining like this, and eventually they're going to catch up and they don't understand socialism. They're they're all socialists now, and uh, just uh, I mean the mixed economy. Um, uh, Mises was always saying is that you know it's it's hard to keep it mixed. It's it's going to veer one way or the other. And if Samuelson and Krugman had their way, we know in which direction it would veer. Uh, look, the the mainstream economics, apart from Austrian economists, are very um, anti-market. Well, I I I have to amend that. You know, there's a joke. The economist was asked, how is your wife? And he answered, compare to what? Well, we economists are way better than sociologists and, and political philosophers and uh, philosophers and English literature professors uh, on campus and, and many other disciplines. So I have to pat us on the back, us, we economists, we're better than those, them, our guys. But you compare them, I mean, all they do... I won't say all they do, but their, their big thing is market failure. There's market failure with monopoly. There's market failure with public goods, market failure with inegalitarianism, market failure with, I don't know, externalities. And dozens and dozens of market failures. And the way to make a reputation is show one more market failure. And <laughs> the market, you know, is, is just unstable and needs the steadying hand of government. 
that's the economics profession, and then they have a lot of um, incomprehensible mathematical jargon to sort of prove this sort of a thing. So I'm not a big fan of mainstream econ economists, and uh, certainly Krugman and Samuelson would uh, fit in there. Uh, the proof of it is, is that, you know, right before the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, Sammy is saying they're going to catch up or they're going to surpass us. You know, the, the interesting question is, why is it that the Soviet Union started uh, communism in 1917 and they lasted all the way until 1989, 1991, depending upon whether you count the Berlin Wall or the, or the uh, falling apart of the uh, USSR. Why did they last so long if socialism is so bad? And the answer is they never had pure social. Well, they did have pure socialism from 17 to 22. And uh, it was a disaster. And even they had to give it up. They started this NEP, New Economic Plan, where they uh, took into account Western prices. But the point is they always had Western prices available to them. Uh, they had the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and they had the um, Sears and Roebuck catalogs, and, and all sorts of things like that. So you never had pure capital, uh, pure communism. Uh, and if you did, the thing would have ended <clears throat> in, in weeks or months and not and certainly not years and certainly not decades. So the reason the Soviet Union lasted as long as it did is because it wasn't pure socialism. It was uh, semi-socialism, and that lasted because it had aspects of the free enterprise system, namely market prices for platinum were higher than steel and, and higher than pretzels or whatever it was. So they had they had some insights into real economics rather than just Akami economics. I got to meet uh, David Friedman at the Freedom Summit in Arizona, and he talks about market failure as, yes, it's a problem, but the solution certainly is not to give the solution to a group of politicians who pay no price for being wrong. Talk about market failure. Um, what was uh, your uh, relationship with Milton Friedman? Well, I'll answer that, uh, Milton and David. Yeah. Um, I, I have a picture of Milton Friedman, me and Milton, and I once accused him, accused him of being a road socialist because he believed <laughs> would uh, better, better provide uh, roads. And uh, he didn't really appreciate me calling him a road socialist. I don't know why. He was a road socialist. He believed that government was needed for roads. Another debate I had with him was, um, what was it? I was favoring um, reparations for um, uh for black slaves and for uh, uh, people uh, in South America, the Latifundia, where they stole the land of the peons. And Milton Friedman kept saying, yeah, yeah, but, you know, land is only 10% uh, of the GDP. So let's forget about um, uh, reparations, uh, land, taking land away from, uh, say, a white uh, grandchild of slave uh, owners and giving it to a black grandchild of of slaves, and let's just have free enterprise now. And I kept saying, yes, yes, you're right. Probably uh, from an economic point of view, it wouldn't matter that much if you didn't have reparations, but aren't they just? And he didn't understand the word just. Uh, it was almost not in his lexicon. Uh, he would say things like justice will ruin the world and it'll lead to war or something. He just couldn't understand that, yes, uh, having land reparations wasn't as imp – I agreed with him. Land reparations probably wouldn't help the Latifundia people or the black uh, people as much as having freedom now would help them much more. But still, uh, as a matter of justice, you, you know, if, if uh, my grandfather stole something from your grandfather uh, – and, and gave it to you, it should be given back to me. So that was another issue that I had with him. Uh, with regard to David Friedman, um, I'm not a real big fan of his. He is an anarchist, and I salute him for that. Uh, and he is a, a, a very strong supporter of free enterprise, as was Milton Friedman, although Milton Friedman, you know, you know, Murray, Murray Rothbard had the law that people specialize in what they're worst in. So what did Milton Friedman specialize in? The two things that he was worst in, namely money and uh, vouchers. He was just specializing in what he's the worst in. Now, David Friedman says, yes, there are market failures, but government will make it worse. 
Well, I agree with the second part of it, but I don't agree with the first part of it. I don't see any market failures uh, as an Austrian economist. He's not an Austrian. He's a neoclassical economist, and he believes that monopoly and externalities and public goods and all these things are market failures. But he has the insight, uh, and I applaud him for that, to say that uh, typically or almost always or maybe always, uh, government attempts to rectify will just worsen it. Okay, but as a as a uh, I don't know a truthful or uh, as an attempt to get to the truth, I don't think there are market failures in the first place. So I would disagree with David on that. Another Ooh. point. I, just going to give you one more point. Uh, uh, Milton Friedman. Um, Milton Friedman uh, favored the um, the volunteer military during the Vietnam War. Now look, as a libertarian, I don't favor the draft. And the reason I don't favor the draft is because it's like slavery. But, and Milton Friedman would agree with that, but Milton Friedman had one other reason why he wanted to get rid of the draft, and that was to make the U.S. military more efficient. And I didn't really want the U.S. military to be more efficient in Vietnam because I didn't think we belonged in Vietnam in the first place. So if you're doing something bad, at least do it inefficiently. Don't do it efficiently because uh, uh, efficient bad is worse than inefficient bad. If you have to do something bad, do it ineptly. Do it uh, inefficiently. So Milton Friedman was a bit of a warmonger. He wanted the U.S. military, which I regarded as unjust in Vietnam. The hell are we doing in Vietnam? It's 10,000 miles away. The, as Muhammad Ali once said, uh, a hero of mine, said, no Vietnamese ever called me the N-word. Uh, that was when he didn't want to go and fight them. I mean, if somebody calls him the N-word, he'll fight him, presumably. But the, <laughs> Vietnam, the point is, uh, Vietnamese never did anything to us. And, you know, now that, you know, we're not fighting with them, we're trading with them, and, and that's much better. So there's another area where I would disagree with Milton Friedman. Yeah, well, that's why uh, Johnson and McNamara had to stage the uh, Gulf of Tonkin. Who, Speaking of... Johnson, who do you think are the worst presidents in American history and the best, if such a thing exists? Well, that's a good one. Uh, uh, John LBJ was very bad. Uh, he uh, had the um, uh, Tom DeLorenzo is going to get on my case because he's going to want me to say Lincoln. And Lincoln was horrible. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll agree with Tom. Lincoln was the worst. But uh, I have a uh, 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 a soft spot in my heart for LBJ. Uh, he ruined the black family. Before LBJ started his, uh, well, not Brave New World, what did he start? Great um, Society. Great Society. Uh, the black family was pretty intact. Not as intact as the white family, but pretty intact. And uh, he started this welfare, and, and Charles Murray wrote this book, Losing Ground, showing that uh, the uh, the Johnson was so generous with other people's money uh, that he gave a, 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 a pregnant girl a lot more money than the uh, man who impregnated her. And it, it sort of broke up the family. Now, getting back to this Florida case, you know, where the 17 kids were killed, my understanding is that of all the, the um, uh, high school shootings and all the mass shootings, I think like 98% of them were by young men who, did, who came from non-intact families. So LBJ uh, did very, very bad. Uh, uh, you know, if you, by the way, there is no black poverty, virtually no black poverty for intact families. Virtually all of the black poverty is from non-intact families. The family is very important and having a father in the, in the home civilizes the, the children in a way that the mother can help but can't do without the father. So I, I, uh, I'm going to vote for LBJ for second to, uh, uh, to um, Lincoln. And who are the good presidents? Well, the good presidents, hard to even remember their names, Harrison, Polk, I don't know, uh, those guys that didn't do much of anything. I think one president died after three months in office. He was a good guy. He didn't do much of anything. Tom Woods wrote a book about the, the president in 1921 who did nothing when there was a, a downturn. I forgot the name of the president. Warren G. Harding. Or my man, Warren G. Harding. Wilson is another bad guy um, getting us into wars and stuff. And Eisenhower, no, it was Truman who dropped the atom bomb. So, you know, we libertarians look upon presidents almost the reverse of everyone else. Everyone else thinks Lincoln and LBJ were great. And Warren G. Harding and Polk and those other guys 
uh, that nobody, McKinley, that nobody ever heard of uh, are bad, and we see the very opposite. So this is my favorite question to ask. I asked Jeffrey Tucker, Stephen Kinsella, and Larry Sharp this question. I asked one book they would recommend everyone to read. Tucker said All, uh, Auburn Herbert's Right and Wrong Compulsion by the State. Kinsella said Economics in One Lesson by Hazlitt. And Larry Sharp said The Law by Frederick Bastiat. What's one book, if you could have everyone read, what would it be? Well, that's a tough question. The The two books that converted me to libertarianism were Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand and, and Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. So I'd put those two in there. And then I'd say pretty much anything by Murray Rothbard, <laughs> For New Liberty, The Ethics of Liberty. Um, those would be good books. So I'm ducking your question. I'm not giving you one book. I'm giving you four or five. But it's sort of, you know, uh, which do you like, vanilla or chocolate? The right answer is both. <laughs> but I suppose if I had to pick one book, I don't know, uh, maybe The Ethics of Liberty and maybe Atlas Shrugged. Maybe Atlas Shrugged, that's my favorite novel. Um, I'm a big fan of Ayn Rand, uh, Ayn Rand's writing, not her personally. I mean, she was very hateful against libertarians. She called us hippies of the right. But still, Atlas Shrugged, I've read that book maybe every 10 years since I was 20, and I'm 76, so maybe five times. And I've never read... Um, uh, the Ethics of Liberty or For a New Liberty or, or Man, Economy, and State seven times. So I guess I'd have to go with Atlas Shrugged. God we, have, we have two minutes left. What is the most important things, what are the most important things you learned quickly from Murray Rothbard and Ludwig von Mises? Well, I don't like to brag, but I shook Ludwig von Mises' hand and I never washed it since. So if you shake my hand, you channel Mises. That's not what I learned from him. I guess what I learned from him was Austrian economics. And what I learned from Murray Rothbard is, God, he was my mentor, my friend for many years. Uh, I revere the man. Uh, maybe uh, having a sense of humor. I mean, my big problem with Murray was stomach cramps. Uh, you just in his presence and you're laughing and laughing and laughing. I guess maybe the, the most important thing I learned from Murray, apart from the substantive uh, economics and, and libertarianism, would be to have fun. Murray was called even by um, uh, Buckley, the merry or the happy libertarian. And I think we should have fun. We're supposed to have fun in this life. And uh, I think what I learned from Murray is to have fun while promoting liberty. Well, it's interesting that Murray said uh, that Buckley and National Review might be a CIA operation. Yes, well, that's true. But still, Buckley uh, uh, correctly uh, identified Murray as the happy, the happy warrior or the happy band or something like that. Uh, Murray's middle name should have been Happy, not Newton. He was deliriously, contagiously happy. He was, he was just so much fun. He, he was magnificent. I used to read Man Economy of State and then go over to his house after at night, and I couldn't believe that he'd want to have anything to do with me, but, but he just wanted to be my friend, and, and I couldn't understand that how that could be, because he was, it's sort of like being friends with Mozart or Bach. Uh, I'm a big fan of Mozart and Bach, and you can't be friends with me. You could just revere them, but I, somehow I became Murray's friend. Don't ask. Yeah. Well, re reading uh, Anatomy of the State really makes you uh, th think that Rothbard is the uh, Mozart of libertarianism, politics, economics, and philosophy, and history. Uh, uh, again, Professor Block, thank you so much for your time. Just stay with me for 30 more seconds. Again, Defending the Undefendable is the book. Thank you for watching. Keith Knight, don't tread on anyone. Thanks for having me on your show. Take care.